So if you're watching this video, you're probably somewhat familiar with Bernoulli's equation, but just to remind you, Bernoulli's equation of fluid mechanics relates flow energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy along a streamline. So what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on the development of Bernoulli's equation as simplification of the Navier-Stokes equations valid under certain conditions. And so without derivation, the continuity of Navier-Stokes equations for steady and compressible flow, constant fluid properties are given like this. Here's the continuity equation, and here are the momentum or Navier-Stokes equations. Okay, the solution of these Navier-Stokes equations with the continuity equation will give us a complete flow field description. Unfortunately, analytics, analytic solutions to the equation for most practical engineering problems aren't available. So what else could you do? Well, you could solve these equations numerically. That's the field of computational fluid dynamics. That approach is expensive and maybe either infeasible for really complicated geometries or provide more information than is necessary for many engineering applications. In other words, it may be overkill. So what we want to do is we want to simplify our approach when the physics of the problem permits it. In particular, we want to see how Bernoulli's equation can be derived as a simplification of the full Navier-Stokes equations. So first we need to go over some preliminary mathematical concepts as related to fluid mechanics. In particular, we need to discuss the concept of a velocity potential and a potential flow. So by definition, if V is the velocity vector and del cross V is equal to zero, then the flow is irrotational. So what do I mean by irrotational? Well, think about a merry-go-round and a Ferris wheel. Here's an irrotational flow here. That's the Ferris wheel analogy. So see, you're sitting on this Ferris wheel here. It's going around and around, but the box always stays um, vertical. Okay? You don't fall out of the box. So notice that black line always is in a horizontal direction. Okay, so this particle isn't rotating, if that's a fluid particle. Down here, the merry-go-round analogy, now you can see that the particle is rotating as it goes around, or this would also be, say, something sitting on top of a record player. Okay, so that's a merry-go-round analogy. So there's an irrotational fluid particle, here's a rotational particle. We've also got to introduce the vorticity vector omega, which by definition, omega is del cross V. Okay, so you have to remember this. So very close to a solid surface and at high Reynolds numbers, you find a region known as the boundary layer. And in that region, viscous forces are significant and the flow is rotational. Um, and the vorticity is non-zero then, of course. The boundary layer is typically really thin. And outside that thin boundary layer region, you often approximate the flow as irrotational. Okay, the region adjacent to an airplane wing, for instance, would be a good example of where there's a boundary layer and the flow would be nearly rot irrotational away from the airplane wing. So we're going to start our derivation from the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations for a constant property fluid. Looks like this. And first off, we're going to assume we're dealing with properties where the viscous, or problems where the viscous forces are really small. Okay, so in that case, the viscous force term can be neglected, and you've got a balance of inertial terms and the pressure forces right here. Okay, so when can you do this? You can usually do this at high Reynolds numbers. Okay, Reynolds numbers ratio of inertial to viscous terms. Um, and if the inertial terms are really large and the viscous terms are small, Reynolds number is large. Um, that's where this is valid. So let's also assume that gravity acts in the negative z direction. That is, gravity is going to be up and down. And so g bar, the gravity vector, is going to be minus g in the k direction. Um, <clears throat> and that can be written as minus g grad z. Well, how did I go from here to here? Well, think of gradient of z. It's i dz dx plus j dz dy plus k dz dz. Z is not a function of x, so that goes away. Z is not a function of y, so that goes away. dz dz is unity, so grad z is k. That's how we went from here to here. And going from here to here is obviously straightforward because gravity is constant. Okay, the third thing we want to do is we want to rewrite the nonlinear convective term. That's this term. That's the difficult term. On the left side, using the vector relation given here. Okay, you can look in any math book and find this vector relation. So <clears throat> if we, again, it's a steady flow and we utilize the definition of vorticity, we can rewrite our equation in this form right here. Okay, so I put vorticity in here for the del cross V term, um, and this is the equation. Since density is constant for an incompressible flow, we can bring rho inside the gradient oper operator here and gather all the terms that are operated on by the gradient operator. And that gives us this v cross omega over here. So 
we're starting to look like Bernoulli's equation, but we're not there. I see something in this parentheses that looks what we're, looks like what we're looking for, but how to get a little bit further? Well, we've got to take the scalar product of the velocity vector on both sides of this equation. So we'll go v dot grad, what's in the parentheses, v dot v cross omega right here. Okay, and if we do that, we need to look at the right-hand side. So v cross omega gives you a vector that's perpendicular to both v and omega, right? And so if I've got a vector here that's perpendicular to v and omega, and I dot that with v, then it's zero, right? Because there's no component of this vector in the direction of this vector. So that becomes zero. So now we end up right here. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And we're going to have to recognize the operator v dot grad something is the steady form of the material derivative. Okay, so if you recall from probably an undergraduate fluids class, that the material, or also called Lagrangian derivative, describes the time rate of change of a physical quantity, such as momentum, of a material element that's convected in the flow. You've probably seen it written like this, DDT, capital DDT is partial with respect to T plus U dot grad um, phi, or whatever it happens to be in here. So we're doing steady flow, so that term drops out. Okay, so <clears throat> this equation right here can be interpreted as stating that the sum of what's in the parentheses here remains constant for a particle as it convects with the flow. Okay, and that's of course along a streamline because it convects with the flow, it does so along a streamline. So then the final result is then along a streamline, V squared over two plus P over rho plus GZ is a constant. In other words, kinetic energy plus flow energy plus potential energy is constant along a streamline. Different streamlines have different values for the constant. Okay, that's the form that you see most often and you usually see the requirement that it's valid along a streamline. What I want to do next is look at an exception to the requirement for the equation to be valid along a streamline. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And again, we're going to start from the incompressible neighbor Stokes equations for the constant property fluid right here. And the difference is this time we're not going to assume this term is small. What we're going to assume is the flow is irrotational, del cross V is equal to zero and see what that does to this term. Okay, so to make more progress, we first need to introduce the concept of a velocity potential. So for irrotational flows, one can express the velocity as the gradient of a scalar, say phi like this. V is gradient of phi. Okay, so by definition, del cross V is del cross grad phi is equal to zero. That's a vector identity, another one. Del cross grad phi is zero. That's a vector identity, find it in the math book. Um, del cross v is equal to del cross grad phi, and that's equal to zero. Okay, then if we look at the continuity equation for an incompressible fluid, del dot v is equal to zero, and substitute our expression for the velocity potential into that equation, v again is grad phi, you end up with del dot grad phi or del squared phi is equal to zero. Okay, and that came from mass conservation. Okay, so that's the Laplace equation for a solution of the velocity potential. The beauty, the beauty of that equation is that it's linear so that you can impose, superimpose solutions. So if phi1 is a solution, phi2 is a solution, then phi3 is phi1 plus phi2, that's also a solution. How does that help in driving Bernoulli's equation? Well, let's see. Look at the viscous term right here, mu del squared phi. That's equal to mu del squared, as I should have said, mu del squared v is mu del squared grad phi, right? Because v is equal to the gradient of phi, we can express v as grad phi if the flow is irrotational. Now I can interchange the order of these operators, the del squared operator and the grad operator. And you can see this right here, del squared phi is equal to zero. So mu del squared v is equal to zero identically. Okay, so what's the difference between this treatment and what we saw previously? Remember previously we said that the viscous forces were small, not that the term was identically zero. In addition, we didn't require that the flow to be irrotational. So in the present case, by assuming an irrotational flow, that term drops out um, exactly. So now we're going to start with the following form of the momentum equation. I'll give it right here. Okay. So <clears throat> we, didn't, we didn't need to take the dot product this time to remove the v, del cross V term. Why? Because it falls out naturally because omega is equal to zero. Remember last time we did V dot the left-hand side, V dot the right-hand side. Now we don't have to. That term falls out because omega is zero. Okay. And then if I gather the terms um, within the gradient operator, we end up right here. Okay, so that what we've got now is the gradient of the kinetic energy, the flow energy, and the potential energy equal to zero over the flow field. So we're essentially done. That equation says, like I just mentioned, 
the gradient of this quantity right here within the flow field equals zero. So in other words, v squared over two plus p over rho plus gz itself is a constant, right? Because the gradient of a constant equals zero. So that's gotta be a constant. So that's what we found earlier. Well, yes and no, it looks like the same equation, but no one, the restrictions of its use, they're completely different. Previously, the constant was only a constant on a given streamline, and that constant might change from streamline to streamline. For this flow, or for this, under these conditions, for irrotational flow, the constant is constant throughout the flow, and hence the equation is valid across streamlines. So for irrotational flows, you're valid across streamlines. For rotational flows, you're only valid on a streamline. So are there applications where that's useful to apply Bernoulli's equation across streamlines? Um, different than what you usually see in a typical undergraduate fluids class. So consider the flow between two lifting surfaces at a high Reynolds number, say in sailboat sails, okay, where we want to compute the lift, but not the drag, at least unless we're considering induced drag. Um, and we're going to assume a rotational approach flow. Okay, so we want to, we're going to have two airfoils, sailboat sails, let's say, in two dimensions. We're going to assume a rotational flow. And we want to get the lift of those two airfoils. Okay. In this case, a thin boundary layer will exist along the surfaces, but outside the thin foil, or the thin boundary layer, the flow is approximated as irrotational. So we could solve using the Euler equations for this inviscid flow to find the velocity and pressure, and pressure fields. But unfortunately, again, the Euler equations are difficult. They're computationally intensive to solve, um, mostly in, due to the nonlinear term on the left-hand side. So what's our alternative? We can solve the linear Laplace equation del squared phi equals zero for the velocity potential with appropriate boundary conditions, of course, and then determine the velocity field using the definition as V is grad phi. Okay, so the idea is to solve for phi from a linear equation and then get the velocity as a gradient of that scalar. Okay, that gives us the velocity without the inherent difficulty of the nonlinear terms in the Euler equations. That's a big deal. So did somehow we cheat the physics of the system by getting around the nonlinear of the flow field? It doesn't seem like that's possible, and it's actually really not. So we're not done, but we still need the pressure field. So we can now find the pressure field, given that the velocity field we obtained from the solution of the potential flow equation by using Bernoulli's equation. Okay, and we can apply that across streamlines too. So note the nonlinear term in the Euler equation now appears in the Bernoulli equation as a function of the velocity magnitude. Okay, squared, and that doesn't cause us an issue because we got the velocity from the potential equation. So as a reminder, the potential flow equation came from mass conservation. Bernoulli equation came from Newton's second law as a simplification of the Abra-Stokes equations. So we're not going to find viscous drag, at least not in a two-dimensional problem, because we're not including viscous forces. The Euler equation doesn't enforce a no-slip condition on a solid surface, so the Euler equation is not going to get you viscous drag either. Um, if we're looking at a wing in three dimensions with a wing tip, um, we wouldn't get viscous drag, but we would be able to compute induced drag. Okay, and sometimes induced drag is called drag due to lift. So to summarize, Bernoulli's equation is valid only along a streamline for rotational flows, but in viscid flows. For rotational but in viscid flows. Bernoulli's equation is valid across streamlines if the flow is irrotational. Okay, so this is a little bit more, maybe a more theoretical lecture than some that you may have seen on Bernoulli's equation, but hopefully it helps shed some light on the subject and hope you got something out of it.